The countdown is on in Europe. This is Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson and Alex Steele. Monday the 11th, 30 minutes to the close. What do you need to know out of Europe? Gilts continue their sell-off. Traders betting that the Bank of England will now hike by the end of the year. Governor Andrew Bailey, Michael Saunders over the weekend highlighting their concerns over inflation. The London Metals Exchange looks to step from futures into physical markets with a partnership with Metals Hub. We're going to be joined by the LME CEO, Matt Chamberlain, to talk about that partnership and the return of a scale down. LME week. There's going to be some parties in London this mm. week, though. And ASOS uh, falls out of fashion with investors. This is a management shake-up, sees the company's uh, CEO, Nick Mason, stepping aside. Supply chain issues forcing the clothing retailer to issue a profit warning today. The stock absolutely getting slammed on the back of that one. Let's take a look where stocks are more broadly. Uh, equities absolutely flat today, going nowhere. Remember, the bond market is closed stateside. Brain crude, though, Alex, your bailiwick up by 1.8 percent. Unbelievable. And WTI actually outperforming, up by over 2 percent. Uh, so here in the U.S., like you mentioned, the bond markets are closed, but I wanted to highlight energy and, and bank index because the cyclicals are totally in charge of the S&P. Freeport still the best performing stock within the S&P. And energy, to your point, outperforming over 1 percent. KBW bank index still up by 6 cents of 1 percent, up some like 40 percent so far this year as we head into bank earnings. What's priced in the whole raise and beat uh, or lower and beat and then raise and beat model? Like that's all going to go by the wayside if we try and take into account de loan demand as well as input costs. And even though the bond market's not trading, the futures market is. So this is the TYA, which is the 10-year uh, bond futures index. So a little bit of selling here. Uh, yields probably pushing a little bit higher. And to your point, we'll be talking to the, uh, the CEO of the LME. You have aluminum up by 2.8%. We haven't seen these levels in like 13 years, continuing to grind higher. I really worry that we're going to, at some point, that's going to come into bite uh, margins. And we just have to wonder how long the demand's going to hold up until the margin squeeze becomes very real and needs to be priced in. We're going to talk more about energy in just a moment. I, the industrial sector over here in the UK really worried about the lack of availability, potentially, of energy. You're going to see demand destruction, potentially. We'll wait, we'll see what happens, but it's a risk. And it's certainly something that the Bank of England is monitoring very carefully as well. That inflationary narrative becoming more and more part of what the bank is talking about. Over the weekend, Andrew Bailey warning of a potentially, quote, very damaging period of inflation unless policymakers take action. He wasn't the only one. MPC member Michael Saunders also suggesting investors were right to bring forward bets on rate hikes. Here with more on this story, Bloomberg News is Ven Rahm. Ven, we've already seen to a certain extent the market front running this. The market has been out in front. It's looked at what the bank was saying and said, you know what, actually, we think there's a bigger risk than maybe you're letting on. The bank is belatedly starting to catch up. So how much of this potential rate hike news is already in the price? Good afternoon, Jonathan. I think there's plenty of, of the BOE tightening already priced into the market. If you look at the two-year guilt yield, we are now around 60 basis points. Essentially, that means that the spread between two-year gilts and the bank rate is 50 basis points. So, and this spread, as, as traditionally presaged and positioned very well ahead of BOE rate hikes or rate cuts in previous cycles. So, in other words, this spread is now telling you that the markets are very well prepared for two rate hikes at the very least that will take the bank rate to, 20, to 50 basis points. And you know what? I, I think that guild deals have more to search, all, albeit a limited room to search from here, because there is nothing to stop the markets from positioning for a third rate hike. Mm -hmm. Though I do think that the pace of increase in guilds that we have seen, in guild deals that we have seen, may need to moderate going forward. All right, Ben, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Having some uh, connection issues there, but we appreciate you uh, staying with us, Ben Rem, uh, joining us from Bloomberg. And it is also the story that will never, ever go away, and that's Brexit. Uh, Britain is now headed for a clash with the European Union this week over the border controls in Northern Ireland. Here with Morris Joe Mays, Bloomberg News UK government reporter. Joe, what's the latest here? Yes, we've got a pretty big speech being given by Brexit Minister David Frost in Lisbon tomorrow, where the tension is just ratcheting up once again. We have the UK saying the Northern Ireland Protocol, that 
passed the divorce treaty, which was designed to stop hard border emerging in Ireland. The UK says that needs to be fundamentally significantly changed because they say it is causing disruption to trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Now, the EU is saying, well, you know, we're trying to come up with practical fixes to make the protocol work better. But the UK sign is that they, they say this is not enough. We need fundamental altering of this protocol. And that's something the EU doesn't seem to want to give. So I think that'll be the key message from Frost tomorrow in Lisbon. And the key question is, you know, how would the EU react to that? Will they be willing to give way on key issues like the governance of the European Court of Justice or the protocol? That looks unlikely. If they don't give way, the UK is essentially saying, well, we're going to suspend parts of the protocol because we don't think that's good enough and we want to protect the you know, internal unity of the United Kingdom. And if that happens, then the EU might start a trade war essentially with the UK and say, look, we want to retaliate against you. We don't think you're justified in suspending the protocol. So we're back in this realm of, you know, serious tensions, approaching a boiling point. You know, it's Brexit all over again. Yeah, I feel like we've been here before, Joe. Uh, but what we need now, given all the supply chain constraints that we're facing, uh, is a trade war. Bloomberg's Joe Mace, thank you very much indeed. We'll look forward to that speech uh, tomorrow in Lisbon. Um, as Brexit tensions rise, we've also got the possibility uh, of another similar event taking place. Uh, poll exits, the exit of Poland from the EU. Uh, we did see the court ruling last week, which basically suggested that Polish law has supremacy over EU law. This puts both sides in a very, very difficult position. There were protests over the weekend. Uh, Poland, uh, according to the protesters, does not want to leave the EU. But where could this take us? Tensions were already high. Maria Tadeo has more. Yes, and you know, Guy, again, as this conversation whether or not uh, we could see uh, Poland leave the European Union, that was, of course, uh, the headline of the story, and you had that very controversial court ruling from the Polish uh, Constitutional Court. Now, a number of things on this, of course, is that what we're seeing, however, is that when you look at member states of the EU, they know that betting on an exit from the European Union, in this case, Poland doesn't have the euro, but also betting on a euro exit does not actually bode well, potentially, for the economy. So they're switching or moving away from their traditional let's leave to actually say we want to stay in the European Union but we want to change the rules. We want to kind of move away power from Brussels and that's exactly what the Polish uh, government is trying to say. A lot of these matters should stay national. Of course what you know is that this is a rule that is not just about the courts but it's also about the fundamental values of the European Union. Now are we going to see an exit? Probably no. When you look at polls it does show that Polish uh, citizens do want to stay in the European Union but it does set a potential big challenge on the judiciary front, but also in terms of the money that Poland was expecting to get from the European Commission. What is very clear now in my reporting is that the European Union is not going to give a cent to the Polish government. They don't backtrack on some of these measures. Again, that could put a lot of the Polish assets under pressure if that is the case, if we don't see that stimulus money going into the country. And again, uh, Guy, just as a final point, we did see inflation in the country surging. The Polish government is under a lot of uh, pressure and stress to try to tame that down. So, of course, you don't want to have a political storm in the midst of an economic one. No. Uh, Maria, that is certainly something that sounds like a good idea. Whether or not it actually comes to pass, we'll wait and see. Maria today joining us from Berlin. Uh, talking of political storms and economic ones, the UK is facing both. Oil prices racing higher, Brent approaching $85 a barrel uh, as the growing power crisis across Europe um, continues to provide problems, Asia and Europe, both competing for gas and for oil. Rachel Morrison is here with the latest. Are we starting to talk about demand destruction? That was my sense reading the papers around Europe this weekend, that industrials are starting to get nervous. They're worried that they will not get what they want, and they're talking about suppressing activity. That's right. We're hearing a lot more from industry about how difficult they're finding prices that are this high. They've been this high for quite some time and there doesn't look like there's any chance that they're going to drop anytime soon. So we're hearing meetings in the UK between industry and government, and that's the case all over Europe. We have a story today with data showing that industrial gas use is 12% lower this month than it was pre-pandemic. So it is in the numbers as well. Companies, manufacturers are making less, and it's because gas prices are so high. And how long that continues and how much worse it gets depends on what governments can do to help industry and to try to shield them from some of these prices. There is a limited amount that the government can do, particularly in the UK. The industry have outlined several options they would like the government to consider, but 
it's difficult. They can't intervene in the market easily and things kicking the can down the road on renewable costs and um, things that companies have to pay will only make it more expensive later on. All right, Rachel, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Bloomberg's Rachel Morrison uh, joining us there. Um, well, coming up, we'll get back to that main top story and what's happening in the gilt market. They continue to sell off, yields push higher. Jeff Yu, BNY Mellon, senior EMEA market strategist, will be joining us next. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First Word News. I'm Laura Wright. In Austria, Foreign Minister Alexander Schollenberg was sworn in today as the new Chancellor. He's a close ally of Sebastian Kurz, the departing Conservative leader who resigned over a corruption scandal. Kurz will retain his influence as leader of the People's Party, but he faces criminal charges in at least two investigations. In Germany, Christian Democratic Chairman Armin Laschet will leave his post by January. Laschet lost a close election last month to Social Democrat Olaf Scholz. Chancellor Angela Merkel's party will search for new leadership. British officials are concerned that a lack of pilots could slow down a rebound in flights to pre-pandemic levels. That's according to the Telegraph newspaper. At least double the usual number of pilots reportedly retired during the time when most travel was banned. The UK recently eased entry rules for foreign travellers in a bid to boost tourism. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Laura Wright. This is Bloomberg. Guy, Alex. All right. Thanks so much, Laura. So uh, the top story over in the UK, uh, are there some comments coming from two BOE officials that are really driving the surge in gilt yields that really started a couple weeks ago. Michael Saunders and Governor Andrew Bailey doubled down on the possibility of an imminent rate hike on rising inflation risks. Now, Saunders suggested traders have been right to bring forward bets on rate hikes, telling The Telegraph, quote, it is appropriate that the markets have moved to pricing a significantly earlier path of tightening than they did previously. Right now, that's looking like 18 basis points, definitely a 15 basis point hike by the end of this year. Uh, well, Jeff, you, BNY Mellon Senior EMEA uh, Market Strategist, joins us now. What's your call? Is the market right? Is the market leading the BOE? No, it's not. I think this is policy error. Um, I don't think that the UK economy is in a position to withstand rate hikes. You know, there are many transmission channels where this could actually be quite damaging, you know, mostly through variable rate mortgages. Uh, this will bring the costs of uh, servicing those mortgages higher. It doesn't sound like much. On an individual basis, it's OK. But if you think of the government cuts uh, coming through, some have already taken place. Furlough has ended. Uh, real incomes, they're probably not going to rise as strongly as inflation could rise and other supply issues. I think this is rather risky territory here. Um, let, let's talk about what the, the other side of that is. If we end up in a situation where inflation is more persistent and starts to become embedded, the bank may take the view that that is actually the bigger threat. What's wrong with that argument? Well, what type of inflation is becoming persistent? Is it wages? We don't even have a good snapshot of the labour market yet because furlough yep. has just ended. The BOE has itself admitted that. So we can't definitively say it's wages yet. Uh, so then it's going to be supply issues, that, that kind of persistence. Well, if it's that, then that, re that eats into real incomes. And we could see the household demand destruction on top of the corporate demand destruction that your program just talked about. So again, putting those together, I just don't see a clear case for, say, second round effects, some coming through or otherwise. And that's why I think, you know, this is really risking policy error. So you may not think that, but it feels like the actual BOE could be on a different trajectory. I mean, do, do you think that the market is leading the BOE? I understand that you don't think so, but it seems like this is a different kind of world. I think it's a combination of both. You know, last week, I think it was last Tuesday or Wednesday when we actually had a move um, in, uh, in pricing uh, for uh, December uh, hikes. So I don't think there was actually much data on the back of uh, that. So markets actually moved, I would say, ahead mm. of the commentary over the weekend for sure. Now, whether that was due to the energy issues or, again, going back to the persistence of inflation, uh, personally, I, I respect the price action. I'm not sure what drove the market into that sort of a reaction. We've had two, maybe more members comment on that yet. Do we have a majority of vote in favor yet? So if it's yep. the market leading, the market's taking a risk. The BOE is confirming, well, BOE is taking a risk too.
Jeff, what would it do to the Bank of England's credibility, which is not great when it comes to promising rate hikes and then delivering upon them, if we do not get them this time round? Well, it's going to be an unreliable, unreliable boyfriend, isn't it? Right. So uh, to paraphrase uh, prior uh, comments. Uh, but again, the risk to credibility is you're actually tightening into a, uh, into a cyclical slowdown, especially on the household side. And then if we think about the combination of going back to mortgage servicing, if that actually starts to impact housing prices or the prospects of house prices, I'm not saying that it will. But if expectations are going to be tamer, then that feeds back into a wealth effect which could actually impact demand as well. You know, we saw that during the global financial crisis as well, how consumption patterns are actually quite tied to housing. So again, I'd like to see more data on the income side. If there is data confirming, yes, the labor market's rip-roaring and we don't have to worry about real income growth, it can withstand additional hikes and mortgage servicing costs, I'll hold up my hand and say, okay, I got it wrong. But right now, we just don't have that confirmation yet. So Did why can't we wait another quarter or two? Jeff, would you be of the mindset that you'd be taking like an active position on the market with that? So right now, I think the best view on that, apart from um, you know, pushing back against um, the prospects of a December hike, is probably euro sterling. I think that's where, if I just look at fiscal differentials, even before this rate hike move, on the fiscal side, I thought the view that the UK was tightening more aggressively than Europe and European peers than, than Eurozone peers, I think that could actually result in upward moves in euro sterling as well. Right now, uh, looking at valuations, I think euro sterling is looking interesting. The German election result, probably uh, if it had been more, say, pro-fiscal expansion, that would have driven it further. But again, I think these are good levels to think about euro sterling higher but i get but again you know right now the setup for the uk is very very sensitive again i'm okay with a precautionary normalization move around 15 basis points back to 25 basis points pre-pandemic but again what's the harm in say waiting until the winter months are over are over wait until we can get a demand recovery around february or even may that's a precautionary back to normal move and then we can embark on a new cycle there. But now to price in an entire cycle, 15 for this year and then more 50 to 75 next year, I think the market really is getting ahead of itself. You could make the argument that maybe the Bank of England should be going in the opposite direction. If we do have cost plus inflation and that is ultimately going to eat into both industrial and consumer demand, that is something that the bank should be potentially leaning in on. We potentially also have a fiscal tightening as well. Taxes are likely to rise. Mm -hmm. I, it, it should the bank, is there the possibility actually the bank ends up having to do effectively a 180 here? Uh, precisely. Uh, the original reason I thought euro sterling would outperform on the fiscal side was because it's going to be very difficult for the bank to hike into uh, fiscal tightening. Right? So um, of all the things that we listed, your corporate rates going up and of course national insurance surcharge, dividend tax um, increases amongst other things uh, uh, as well. So that was already difficult. And if the BOE, again, if they do things early and then compound the situation in terms of household cash flow, because that's the crux of the issue right now, household ca cash flow is going to face serious restraints up ahead over the next six months or so. You hike into that, impact it even further, then you risk and seeing really data fall off um, heading into about mid next year or so. Again, what's the rush? Uh, so why not mm -hmm. wait until we get a better picture of income growth? If it's running, say, 150 basis points over inflation, then they're in a good place. They can move accordingly. Jeff, before we let you go, is there another central bank out there that's looking at a policy mistake? Because it does seem like a trajectory is more in a central bank overall removing accommodation uh, trajectory. Um, I wouldn't say so, actually. Within G10, uh, at the very least, um, the, uh, the BOE probably stands out there. If I had to pick another region, probably Central and Eastern Europe, that's looking very interesting because um, if we are not confident about the cyclical outlook in Eurozone, yet they are hiking very aggressively as well. Once the base effects are stripped out, uh, can they see the labour market in the region continue to recover yep. at such stronger clip? These currencies are quite overheld already. That's where I'm looking for uh, potential U-turns as well. Jeff, in just 10 seconds, how high would you put the possibility of a recession in the next 24 months in the UK? For the UK, very, very low, sub 50% uh, right now. But if the BOE, again, does more than 50 basis points, anything like within six months, I think that changes the equation. Jeff, always a pleasure. Thanks for the analysis. Greatly appreciated. Jeff, you of Bank of New York Mellon. This is Bloomberg. It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash, a look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Laura Wright. 
AT&T has selected Swedish telecom manufacturer Ericsson for an expansion project. Ericsson will help accelerate the growth of the American company's 5G network. It will also support the deployment of AT&T's recently acquired C-brand Spectrum. The US and the European Union plan to announce that at least 20 more countries will join a pledge to reduce methane emissions. Bloomberg's learned that Canada and Germany are among them. Methane is one of the most powerful greenhouse gases, but the UN has found that as much of 80% of measures to curb leaks from oil and gas operations can be implemented at no cost. Natural gas futures in Europe fell today after prices surged to new highs last week. Traders weighed growing concern over the region's supply crunch against prospects for Russia and will it ship more gas? That's the latest Business Flash. Guy, Alex. Laura, thank you very much indeed. Alex, the papers here at the weekend were basically filled with the idea that our winter is dependent on Vladimir Putin. And there were suggestions uh, from the Russian envoy saying, you know what, if you treat us a bit better, if you kind of take a more hostile, uh, sorry, a less hostile stance, then, then that's likely to improve the prospect of us uh, shipping a little bit more gas to you, which is kind of exactly what everybody was worried about. Do... What kind of precautions are people taking over there? Like, I know that you bought a generator, et cetera, but, I mean, say that's the case, that won't go away this winter, right? There'll always then be this geopolitical hangover when it comes to energy. So what are people doing about it? Well, so people at the moment, I don't think, are doing a lot about it. I, I wonder whether we're going to see more failures in terms of energy companies, uh, retail energy companies mm -hmm. here in the UK. That's certainly something we're watching out for. But, but we were talking about this earlier at the beginning of the show. The real danger here is that industrial activity starts to become curtailed. Yeah. Um, it does feel as if the lights are going to stay on at the moment. Um, nice to buy an insurance policy. But nevertheless, I think for industrials, this is where the problem lies. There's a deal being done on CO2. But nevertheless, I, companies can't make the economics work if you're running a large factory, a large plant. Then that's where the, that's where the problem is going to lie. Uh, and I think that could come very, very soon. And government doesn't appear in the position to support. Right. And I think that, that we've already, we literally have already seen this in China. I think the difference is, is that China will backstop growth to some extent and to help individuals or struggling businesses to some extent. In the UK, as we just yep. were talking about with Jeff, it's very different. Now we're looking at potential rate hikes from the BOE, potential tax increases, taking away some of the government programs. It's a very kind of different scenario than in China where we absolutely have seen those, those curbs uh, kick in. Yeah, but, but you put that all together. That's a fairly toxic combination, though, isn't it? And you, yeah. put, you put the energy story as an overlay onto all of that. Makes life very, very difficult uh, for the economy. Um, so you, you wonder whether or not uh, we get, as Jeff said, the unreliable, unreliable boyfriend kind of coming back into play, i.e. the Bank of England is threatening, maybe trying to talk the market in a particular direction, but ultimately doesn't end mm. up delivering upon it. European market close coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Wrapping up the session here in Europe, European equities, to be honest, today going nowhere in a hurry. We're finishing fairly flat. Uh, we are seeing a little bit of our performance in the FTSE 100, but it's not up by much. The CAC's absolutely flat. We'll talk about car four in a moment. The DAX is pretty much flat as well, uh, down by one-tenth of one percent. So at a headline level, not a lot going on. Let's have a quick look at exactly how the session has developed. We'll take a look at the stock 600 uh, to show you that. And to be honest, it's a fairly tight range. Intraday, 457 is where we're closing. We are down by less than one tenth of one percent. We've gone sideways here in Europe, waiting for a catalyst. The earnings season is about to begin. Is that going to provide the action? Let's take a look at uh, where we are with some of the other asset classes. So here we are getting a little bit of action. Um, the Columbus State holiday obviously shutters the bond market stateside. Uh, but take a look at where the Bund is. We're now only negative 12 basis points. Maybe we get a German 10 year at zero. We'll wait and see on that one. Crude prices continue to climb. Most of the action, I think, in TI, but certainly Brent today up quite nicely again. Nice depends on your point of view. We're at 84 now, as you can see. Nat gas, though, just coming a little bit lower. Uh, maybe an expectation that Putin actually delivers on the promise maybe to provide more gas for Europe, taking the steam a little bit out there. But nevertheless, we are still at elevated levels, elevated enough 
potentially to suppress industrial activity. Uh, let's take a quick look at what the sector story looks like. Again, just remember at a headline level, not a lot happening, but the miners are very much on the front foot. Take a look at iron ore, huge bounce back there. Aluminium, aluminum really popping higher as well. The car industry up by 1.4%. The energy sector, as it has been in recent days, really providing some, really, some real strength on the upside. Bottom end of the market, bond market focus. So you've got the utilities down there. Obviously, a, a concern about what is happening with the energy story there as well. Uh, some of the luxury sector, the travel sector, also under pressure. Let's talk individual names now. Car 4. Uh, Bloomberg reporting over the weekend that the deal with the privately head Alcon chain, this consolidation idea within the French supermarket sector, seems to have fallen foul of price, i.e. we can't get the price right, we can't get that consolidation to happening. Car 4 down by 2.5%. Entain. There's a city note out today. They've initiated coverage uh, in the space. They're looking at what is happening with DraftKings, they don't believe that a deal, DraftKings Entain, is going to happen. Entain down by 1.41%. And then as seen on screen, down by 12.2%. ASOS, the fast fashion retailer here in the UK. Alex coming under real pressure. Supply chain issues are a massive problem for this mm -hmm. sector and this company in particular. And the CEO stepping down as well. All right, let's get more on ASOS. I think it's a really interesting story and indicative of what's happening in the broader retail sector. Bloomberg's Deirdre Hipwell uh, joins us now. So some retailers are navigating this because demand is just so strong that they can manage kind of their margin problems because the input costs are rising so much. Where does ASOS sit on that? Well, I think ASOS is, is facing a lot of uh, rising costs that are putting pressure on its margin. You've mentioned the supply chain issues. I mean, this is a big problem for all retailers trying to move goods around the world. And we've also had in recent weeks, we've had both H&M and Boohoo also talking about high supply chain costs. But thinking about ASOS specifically, we've also got labor inflation, wage inflation in the UK. Their marketing spending is rising, so they're having to spend more to acquire new customers. But also... What's happening with customers is during the pandemic when we were all buying slouchy loungewear, we weren't returning clothes as much, whereas now returns are getting back to normal. And that is often a very large cost for an online retailer to have to absorb. So all of these costs are rising, which is why, you know, the outlook has worsened for ASOS. What is the outlook going forward? Christmas now looks really, really difficult. UK consumers are being pressured on a number of different fronts. Uh, we were talking earlier in the show about the possibility of interest rates going higher, but we do already have energy prices going higher. Can I draw a line between one and the other? The other things that consumers have got to think about, does it mean they buy less from ASOS? Well, I think... In general, you know, ASOS would have seen a lot of sales increase during the pandemic when people didn't have any choice because the shops were closed. Obviously, now shops have been reopened. There is much more choice for people um, to choose from. That said, ASOS sales were pretty good in the last year, um, but I think they are expecting sales to um, kind of slow down in, you know, at least in the next six months, possibly before recovering. Um, in late years, because don't forget, today they've also outlined quite an ambitious um, revenue target of hitting £7 billion pounds worth of revenue in the next three to four years. But certainly the, in the short term, there's quite a lot um, of pressure on consumers. But also, consumers are going out to restaurants more and eating. So yep. the spend is being spread across a lot more areas than just clothing. Deirdre, thank you very much indeed. Deirdre Hibbert on what's happening with ASOS and the wider supply story hitting retailers. We get retail sales numbers out of the United States uh, Friday. We'll look forward to seeing exactly what those numbers deliver. Um, talking of things that really took off uh, during the pandemic, sports betting obviously was something we watched very carefully. Um, there wasn't much sports. What there was, people were very keen to bet on. If not, they went into the market. They went into crypto. Uh, but there's an interesting call today by City. Basically, what they're talking about is we are going to get consolidation within sports betting. Um, they've initiated coverage on DraftKings, but they're not convinced that a DraftKings Entain bid here in the UK, that's where Entain is based, is actually going to happen. Why not? There's been a lot of speculation. There's been a lot of chatter about this. Bloomberg's Thomas Seal here with me now to talk about this. This was the expected sort of path that we would see, consolidation. Entain's got quite a big footprint in the States as well, uh, that this industry was going to continue to consolidate very rapidly. Why are people not so sure anymore? It's a very complex deal, and there's already a lot of moving parts. So the bit of the... Uh pie that everyone wants is bet mgm this is a joint venture it's half owned by entain and it's half owned by mgm draftkings has to find a way to unpick that 
and either strike a deal with MGM or sell a license to the underlying technology. This is the secret sauce oh, well, that really makes it valuable. So meanwhile, Entain is growing super fast. It rejected an offer in January that was worth $11 billion. It's already valued more than double that. So, you know, why sell now? So the incentives maybe don't line up. The other thing that may be concerning to Entain shareholders or Entain's board is that the offer from DraftKings is mostly stock, DraftKings mm. stock. Um, and UK shareholders may not want to accept that as payment. The stock is quite volatile. It's already down 30% in a couple of months. So, you know, all of these things mean that the market is really not betting that this deal goes ahead as proposed. So, Thomas, is there another suitor that could come in here if the specifics of DraftKings weren't uh, to Entain's liking? It's a really good question. Um, no one's been flushed out yet. MGM obviously was the previous suitor back in January, but it hasn't made a move. It has, um, MGM CEO last week made some uh, really important comments that they do see a path to controlling BetMGM. That is, you know, the jewel in the, in the crown here, really. BetMGM, you know, just the reason for that, by the way, you know, it's the US market. The US sports yeah. betting market is booming. They see a huge addressable market. So, so that is the key. But consolidation is still part of the narrative. 100%, and we've already seen a load of deals. Yeah. So Caesars, another Las Vegas chain like MGM, bought William Hill last year. Uh, and we've um, seen in the other direction, Paddy Power, now called Flutter, bought uh, the Stars Group, a Canadian betting company. So these transatlantic tie-ups are, are still kind of roaring ahead. All right, Thomas, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. It's a super fascinating story. Bloomberg's Thomas Seal uh, joining us there. I uh, just want to highlight some breaking news for you on Southwest. So remember, uh, they've had to cut their flights, haven't been able to reschedule them due to the fact that they just don't have the personnel to do that. The COO uh, speak, uh, is commenting on those cancellations in a video uh, for employees. He says, we're still short on workers, especially flight crews. We need more staffing cushion for disruptions, uh, quote, cannot tell you that we are out of the woods. Um, I, I can't tell, Guy, if this is a Southwest-specific story or is this sort of the broader problem as we have demand picking up, uh, flights ramping up, and then you yep. don't have the labor, sh labor to support it. I, I think it feels at the moment like a Southwest-specific issue. Bit. Uh, you, you certainly ha you have seen, to a certain extent, some disruptions elsewhere, but nothing like on the scale that we've seen uh, with Southwest. Um, and I think this is going to be a really difficult transition for the aviation industry and companies, in sort of specifically, how they manage labor, labor pushing back potentially in terms of vaccine mandates, in terms yeah. of different working practices. All of that, I think, is going to cause problems. And this may be just representative of what we're going to see going forward. Uh, this is an industry that in the past has faced significant labor problems. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I was going to say, that then you throw the vaccine mandates in there where they're going to have to then yep. either fire or furlough workers that aren't getting their vaccine. This is going to get a lot worse. And I wonder, like, what kind yep. of position this puts any unions in in terms of trying to increase wages, et cetera. Absolutely. But again, it just, like, you take a step back. Labor, labor, labor. Like, this is the story at the moment. Companies in the past have been able to, to kind of dictate. Now they can't. The labor narrative... Uh, it is just in every single conversation that we're having with every single company right now. It's going to be amazing, fascinating to see what happens on some of these calls uh, in terms of what companies have to say about it as we go through the earnings story. Um, we've wrapped up here in Europe. We're done for today. It felt like a quiet session today, didn't it? But it actually, did. a little bit of a spike. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of a spike during the, um, the the auction process here in the UK has really kind of pushed the FTSE 100 up sharply. Um, I, I, I check this every single day. You don't often see this kind of price action during the auction. So right at the tail end of the session, the FTSE up by seven tenths of one percent. Alex, everywhere else flat as a pancake. All right, let's get to where we're not flat, and that is in the commodity market. So not only do we have surging aluminum prices, but also the LME is looking to expand uh, in the base metals market. They're looking uh, for a green aluminum digitally traded. We're going to break all that down with LME CEO Matthew Chamberlain next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets, the European close. I'm Laura Wright. You're looking at a live shot in the principal room. Coming up, Wendy Cutler, Asia Society Policy Institute Vice President. That's at 12.30 p.m. in New York, 5.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First Word News. I'm Laura Wright. 
European governments are leaning toward backing embattled IMF managing director Kristalina Gorgieva. The funds board is preparing to make an imminent decision on the future of the Bulgarian economist. There have been allegations of improper behavior during Gorgieva's previous job at the World Bank. She's denied any wrongdoing. In Poland, nationalist leaders slammed the opposition after the biggest anti-government protests this year. At a demonstration in Warsaw, opposition leader Donald Tusk accused the ruling party of trying to take Poland out of the European Union. The government called that fake news. The UK is headed for a fight with the European Union this week over the border controls in Northern Ireland. UK Brexit Minister David Frost will ask for a significant change in the Northern Ireland protocol that governs post-Brexit trade flows with Ireland. The EU has said it won't renegotiate the agreement, but it's willing to make adjustments to ease bottlenecks. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Laura Wright. This is Bloomberg Guy Alex. All right, thanks so much, Laura. So one of the big market moves of this week and last week were what we're seeing in metal prices. Yes, oil climbing $85 here for Brent, but uh, it's the base metals that are doing really well. Aluminum at the highest level uh, that we've seen since 2008. Copper still climbing higher. City, a little short-term bear, but longer-term bull on the structural shift when it comes to using these metals uh, to green the planet. How much more juice, though, is there? And are we going to see any short-term disruptions as power prices are so high? want to get some insight now with Matthew Chamberlain, a London Metal Exchange CEO. A lot to get through. It's also LME Week. I feel like I haven't even heard of LME Week in the last two years, so it's really exciting that it's back. There's also sort of greening the aluminum supply and trading range. But just in terms of what you're seeing now in the price action, what are you hearing on the ground? Are we at a top? Are, is there still a lot of bullish sentiment out there? Yeah, so as you say, we've actually had our LME uh, seminar today, uh, and uh, it's really been a, a source of discussion. Uh, obviously, as your graph showed, so, some good price action today. Like, I think there's, there's a short-term and a medium-term story here. You know, in the short term, uh, the metals prices, like many of the commodities, are being impacted by a number of transient factors. Uh, you have energy, you have logistics, uh, you have short-term supply disruption. Uh, and I think a lot of the price price movements we, we've been seeing up and down are a consequence of that. But, but it's also undeniable that if we look at where we came from, uh, from the, the depths of the pandemic, there has been this this very you know, this longer term trend, and I think exactly as you say, that is driven by the longer term supply story, i.e., that it's hard to bring new supply online, and the demand side, particularly uh, the green revolution and the need for these metals in a more electric society. The needs of these metals in electric society is certainly something that, that a lot of people are talking about, Matthew. But the focus, it feels, and I know you guys have been discussing this as well, is trying to ensure that as we make this energy transition, the metals we're using fit the narrative, that they've not come from dirty mines, that they've not come from uh, mines that are using non-sustainable energy. You guys are starting to, to move in this direction. So we've got this Metal Hub transaction taking place. How much demand is there for that kind of transparency within the supply chain in the metal market? Yeah, I, I think transparency is absolutely crucial here. You know, we at the LME have been grappling with this question because exactly as you say, metals can't expect to be part of the solution unless we can show that metals themselves are sourced in a responsible and a sustainable manner. So if we take a look at aluminum, like on, on your graph here, we know that a lot of aluminum is produced from low carbon power sources, but a lot is also produced from high carbon power sources. So there have been calls for us to exclude high carbon production, but we don't think that's the right thing to do because then there simply wouldn't be enough aluminum on the market. And that graph you're showing would be even significantly um, more upwardly inclined. 
So what we want to do is to bring transparency and to have a world where there is disclosure uh, of the metal that's traded on our exchange. So if, if you take delivery or you trade metal, you can go and get data about the sustainability characteristics of that metal, be that environmental, be that social, uh, be it the, the provenance story, uh, mm -hmm. and ensure that you are comfortable with the metal that is in your supply chain. Matthew, how much more of a premium will those buyers pay for that green aluminum? Yeah, well, th that's a great question. And I don't think anybody really knows. And if, if you talk in the market and say, what's the green premium for, for aluminum? Normally people will say kind of about $10 a ton, but that's very much a finger in the air number. The, the uh, deal that we've announced today, which is a, a partnership uh, with Metals Hub, which is a spot trading platform, it facilitates the spot trading of specific commodities, is really the first step in helping to answer that question. Because what we foresee is a world where you have the LME to deal with your high level hedging, uh, you're hedging your, your, your broad costs of metal. But there is a more digital way where you can then go and source specific parcels of metal with specific sustainability characteristics like low carbon. And what we can then do together with our partners at Metals Hub is to produce real transaction data that actually answers your question uh, with, with real numbers. Yeah. Matt, can you ever see a situation where there's dirty aluminium and you have to say, no, that's not part of our business anymore? Yeah, great question. So certainly that's what we have done for the human rights elements. So we have already put in place rules that say that if your metal uh, is using child labor or is supporting conflict finance, then we're sorry, but you can't be on our market. And that's because those issues are binary. The world has decided that those are bad things and we're able to put that into our rules. Now, right now, as we know, carbon is it's more of a spectrum. People have different views on the carbon footprint of their product, mm -hmm. and that's why we believe that disclosure and user choice is the right way to deal with it. But look, in five or 10 years' time, yeah. could we see a future where you could only have lower carbon? Yeah, I, I certainly think the world could end up there. Hey, Matt, quickly, about 30 seconds left. Do you expect liquidity to then be drained on your typical aluminum contract and go towards the more green one? So, so that, that's a really important question. And that's why we haven't split the current contract because we do think that would drain liquidity. We're going to use the spot trading platform to build that interest on low carbon. And then maybe we bring that back to the, to the main market when the demand is there. Matt, enjoy the week. It's fantastic to see LME Week back up and running. I appreciate it slightly more subdued than it normally is, but hopefully <laughs> uh, we'll start to, to put that right. I know you've got some great events lined up uh, and we wish you well with that. Alex even went out and ate inside this weekend. So obviously it's getting crazy. we are getting through some, getting some major milestones here. Matthew Chamberlain, London Metal Exchange CEO. Thank you very much. This is Bloomberg. All right, we got some upside here on the S&P, up by about four-tenths of 1% but volumes, really light. Let's get a look at some of the movers here with Bloomberg's uh, Abigail Doolittle. Abigail, what do you got? Well, Alex, these are the top point boosts for the S&P 500. It's really a reversal from a few hours ago because the pre-market, it was in the red, declining, especially technology. But at this point, you have tech trading higher. And it was interesting because at that time, tech was trading higher, banks, uh, or excuse me, tech had been higher, banks lower. Even though the bond market's closed here in the U.S., it was almost as though stocks here in the pre-market market we're trading off the action in the UK and Europe with yields higher there but at this point you can see technology really coming through Apple Microsoft Tesla Nvidia but today is really much more about the cyclical trade the value trade no longer being called the reflation trade perhaps by some if we take a look at it here we're going to see the BP up in a big way up 2.1 percent in sympathy with oil above 81 its best level in more than seven years Occidental Petroleum also higher and then it's also about the metals as Alex was just talking about 10, 15 minutes ago, take a look at Rio Tinto, uh, up about nearly 3% uh, as copper, aluminum, all these metals uh, trading higher. And then
10, interestingly enough, even though, again, bond markets are closed here in the U.S., so there are no yields to judge by on the day here in the U.S., perhaps it's that gilt yield or the German 10-year helping out banks because you can see Bank of America nearly up 1%. Or, guy, maybe it's just ahead of earnings season kicking off this week with those very big banks. Yep, talking at the big banks, Jamie Dimon talking at the IAF right now. Some interesting comments on your Bloomberg. Take a look. Uh, what else have we got coming up over the next 24 hours? The IMF World Bank annual meetings, Alex, are going to be kicking off. Uh, we've also got Charlie Evans speaking tomorrow, Chicago Fed. Um, the, t the two big events tomorrow for me are, are kind of later this week are, are the CPI number uh, and the retail sales number later on this week. But it's, it, the week starts to build up tomorrow. Yeah, we got Today more. was a little quiet. Well, we, we got more coming out. First of all, the bond market's going to be open in the U.S., which will definitely help uh, sort of liquidity here. IMF World Economic Outlook's going to come out. G20 trade ministers will meet in Italy. My favorite is the EU green bond sale. It's finally going to happen, and I'm super interested to see what kind of demand we're going to see. I can't imagine how oversubscribed it's actually going to wind up being. I imagine we're going to see some fairly substantial numbers tomorrow. Yeah. Demand has certainly been picking up. Uh, what have we got coming up next? You and I are going to go to radio. We're going to radio. Paul Roma. This is Bloomberg. Yeah, he's going to be with David. <laughs>